The Marlins franchise history is littered with dominant pitching talent. From Kevin Brown to Josh Beckett, Dontrell Willis to Jose Fernandez, Pablo Lopez to Sandy Alcantara, and the list goes on. But while not much team success has come out of that pitching prowess, one of their brightest stars came in one of their darkest windows. In the early 2010s, an era dominated by Doc, Johan, The Freak, and other talented aces, one hulking giant rose above them all, if only for a brief moment. He was dubbed the Anonymous Ace, a fitting legacy for his bizarre career. Today, we'll tell the story of Josh Johnson, his close brush with the Cy Young Award, and how a litany of unfortunate events prevented him from pitching past the age of 30. If you guys enjoyed today's video, consider subscribing to the Jolly Olive channel, and of course, leave a like on the video as well. Josh Johnson was a fourth round pick of the 2002 draft, just one pick after a 22-year-old left-hander by the name of Rich Hill. Hill would pitch in the majors for 19 years and has a chance to complete two full decades if someone signs him for 2024. Despite Hill's longevity, he has eight less wins above replacement in his career compared to Johnson, despite pitching for 10 more years. This is a pretty good lens into how dominant the Marlins pitcher was once he reached MLB, even if it was only for a brief time. In fact, by war standards, Johnson beats many picks that came before him in wins above replacement, many of whom also hold greater name value than him, including Prince Fielder, Scott Scott Casimir, Nick Swisher, and Charlie Morton. One of Johnson's most alluring traits when he was being scouted was his staggering height, clocking in at six foot seven inches, or in more technical terms, Ozzie Albies holding up a $5 foot long. Johnson made quick work in the minor leagues, advancing through the Marlins affiliates in three years and skipping over AAA completely before joining the 2005 team as a member of the bullpen. After that brief cup of coffee, he made the 2006 opening day roster again as a reliever. These Marlins were young and Josh Johnson Johnson was one of their most exciting prospects, ranked third in the system and 80th in all of baseball after the 2005 season. He led a deep group of Marlins pitching prospects like Anibal Sanchez, Scott Olson, and Ricky Nolasco. By the beginning of May, both Johnson and Nolasco were added to the starting rotation in place of struggling starters Jason Vargas and Sergio Mitre, as the Marlins looked to recover from a horrendous 6-18 start to the season. While they further plummeted to 20 games under 500 in mid-May, Johnson certainly did his part, winning his first two starts and not allowing more than three earned runs in any of his first dozen starts through July. He maintained a sub-2 ERA in both May and June, and his 1.89 ERA through this two-month stretch was the second best in the National League, only to Jason Schmidt. The Marlins spun off two separate nine-game win streaks in both June and August to somehow claw their record all the way back to a game over 500 sitting just two games back of a playoff spot in September. However, their season pretty much ended when Johnson went down with a forearm strain a few weeks before the year wrapped up. Johnson finished fourth in National League Rookie of the Year voting that season, but somehow that was only the third highest placing on his own team behind Dan Ugla and winner Hanley Ramirez. Behind him, three other Marlins rookies in Scott Olson, Anibal Sanchez, and Josh Willingham. This remains the record for most rookie players from a single team on the awards ballot. And adding Dontrell Willis on top of all of that arm talent made the future look incredibly bright in Florida. But like most things in the strange history of the Marlins franchise, things didn't go according to plan. What was going to be the start of a new, promising core in 2007 turned to disaster quickly due to an avalanche of injuries. Josh Johnson, Anibal Sanchez, and Ricky Nolasco combined to make just 14 starts due to injury. For Johnson, the ominous forearm strain that ended his 2006 campaign prematurely would completely tank his 2007 season. He missed the first two and a half months with an irritated ulnar nerve, and after returning in mid-June, for four disappointing starts, the team announced that he would require Tommy John surgery, sidelining him for a year. But Johnson astonished many with his incredibly rapid recovery from this devastating injury, rehabbing for less than a year before returning to the mound. Even his manager, Freddy Gonzalez, expected him to be out at least until spring training of 2009. But the Marlins were four games over 500 when Johnson re-entered the fold in 2008, and they'd finished that season with 84 wins, their best record since the 2003 World Series championship year. Johnson pitched well over 14 starts, begging the question of how good the team could have been had their ace pitcher been healthy for the full 162. Little did they know, Johnson was about to embark on the best seasons of his young career in the years that followed. Fast forward to next season, through the first three months of 2009, Johnson owned a top 10 ERA in all of baseball for pitchers with at least 100 innings thrown. He was also fourth in the National League, trailing only Matt Cain, Tim Lincecum, and Dan Heron. As such, Johnson
Johnson got the nod for his first All-Star game alongside teammate Hanley Ramirez. Though Johnson's second half wasn't as impressive, Johnson completed a full season for the first time since 2006, pitching a career-high 209 innings. He went from injury-prone to a workhorse, with his 5.5 Fangraphs war from that year ranking top 10 among all pitchers in baseball. The Marlins once again failed to reach the playoffs despite improving by three wins, and while their team continued to fail in their efforts to reach October, they did succeed in their offseason decision-making. Florida inked Josh Johnson to a four-year contract extension worth $39 million. Now, it didn't come without the usual Marlins penny-pinching beforehand, with the team only willing to offer a two-year deal worth about $13 million or less, before eventually caving months later. But with contract disputes behind them, Johnson embarked on what would become not only his best season as a big leaguer, but one of the greatest pitching seasons in the modern era. After initially struggling through his first four starts of 2010, Johnson announced his presence with a dozen strikeout performance, twirling a dominant complete game victory against the Padres. This kicked off an otherworldly three-month stretch for the hulking Canadian, as Johnson managed a 1.31 ERA in over 110 innings from the beginning of May to the end of July. He won the National League Pitcher of the Month honor in June of 2010, and was an easy shoo-in for the All-Star game once again. However, when many thought he might get the ball to start the All-Star game, that honor instead went to a pitcher who was having his own magic season for the Colorado Rockies. Yeah, 2010 was certainly a moment in time for baseball, to say the least. Let's look at this magazine cover. It depicts the three best pitchers in baseball at the time. Roy Halladay on top, who is a first ballot Hall of Famer, and then Josh Johnson and Yabaldo Jimenez. What a time to be alive. He impressed on the national stage in the All-Star game, punching out Ichiro Suzuki and Derek Jeter in consecutive at-bats. 2010 was the coming out party for Johnson. He maintained the fourth highest average fastball velocity in baseball behind Jimenez, Justin Verlander, and David Price at 94.7 miles per hour. That exact same velocity would have been 36th place for pitchers who threw at least 100 innings last year. His month of August wasn't as pretty as the three months that preceded it, and after one dominant start to kick off September, Johnson was shut down for the remainder of the 2010 season with back pain. The Marlins, who were four games over 500 at the time of his shutdown, played it safe but sputtered through the final month of the season to finish with an 80-82 and 82 record. However, with 183 innings on the season, Johnson was still well within qualification for the ERA title, an honor he clinched on the final day of the season. He finished the year leading the National League in both ERA, ERA+, Plus, fielding independent pitching and home run per nine rate, while also placing within the top four pitchers of his league for Fangraph's war, strikeout percentage, and strikeout to walk percentage. Had he not missed his final five starts and had the Marlins bullpen not given back about six or seven of his wins, Johnson might have had a legitimate shot to win the National League Cy Young Award that year. Instead, the honor went to Roy Halladay, who had a remarkable season in his own right, while Johnson finished in fifth place. Certainly respectable, but shocking nonetheless considering his ERA title. It certainly seemed as though Johnson entered the following season in 2011 with a sizable chip on his shoulder. Before the season kicked off, Sporting News dubbed Josh Johnson the anonymous ace, calling him anonymous because he played for the Marlins, which is kind of a dick move to their fans. But he'd be anything but anonymous once the season got underway. He got off to a dream start in 2011, taking a no-hitter into the fifth inning in four of his first five starts, including one bid that crossed to the eighth inning mark. He won National League Pitcher of the Month in April, dominating opponents with a 0.88 ERA over his first six starts. Johnson immediately became a Cy Young favorite, leading all National League pitchers in ERA by nearly a full run. But sadly, his Cy Young redemption tour derailed railed before it really got started. Johnson was sidelined indefinitely in mid-May with right shoulder inflammation, an injury that would take him out for the entire season. For Johnson, the six foot seven giant attributed the damage of his shoulder to just being a tall human being. After learning his season was over, he explained that, quote, it was a matter of posture. Years and years of being tall, you're always slouching down and bending over. Your shoulder's just not in a good place. You start leaning over when you're throwing and it snowballs. Still, even with this injury, of pitchers with at least 450 innings pitched from 2009 to 2011, Johnson owned the fourth best ERA in baseball over a three-year stretch. His name held company with the likes of Clayton Kershaw, Roy Halladay, and Adam Wainwright. Johnson did pitch the full 2012 season in an impressive comeback and got a landmark highlight by making the first ever start in the New Marlins Park with a full rebrand to boot. But it was clear he was never going to be quite the same dominant ace he was before. His fastball was down from 95 miles per hour in his near Cy Young season to 93 miles per hour in 2012. 
forcing him to use his changeup less since his fastball velocity wasn't there to play off of. Instead, he had to use his breaking pitches more in his slider and curveball. His strikeout numbers dwindled, but he still ended 2012 as an above league average pitcher with nearly 200 innings pitched. But the Marlins front office saw the writing on the wall with Johnson's long-term health, and in the final year of his four-year contract, they packaged him in a massive 11-player swap with the Toronto Blue Jays. Johnson attempted to work in a sinker ball as one of his fastballs due to his weakened velocity, but the experiment didn't exactly go smoothly. For Toronto, he pitched to an ERA over 6 in 16 starts, battling another forearm strain mid-season and ending his season early to remove bone chips from his throwing shoulder. Johnson entered free agency at a rock-bottom point of his career. He caught on with the San Diego Padres on a one-year $8 million deal, but his comeback attempt ended before he ever appeared with the club, needing a second Tommy John surgery in April of 2014. The Padres kept him on payroll with another one-year deal, seeing if he could pull off another miraculous recovery from baseball's scariest injury. But it simply wasn't in the cards for him this time, as Johnson was informed he'd need a third Tommy John surgery in September of 2015, which would sideline him at least until the beginning of the 2017 season. The reality of rebounding from three of these surgeries and being any semblance of a quality pitcher at that seemed non-existent. The pitcher that he was in that magic 2010 season was now long gone, and faced with no other option, Johnson retired in January of 2017. It was a bitter end for Josh Johnson, an outcome many pitchers face in the new era of hard throwing and load management, but as it stands, he's a legend in Marlins franchise history, still the all-time leader for Miami in pitcher war and ERA. A pitcher who nearly won the Cy Young at age 26, Johnson never threw a pitch past age 29 and fell one season shy of a decade of work in MLB. There are anomalies littered everywhere throughout the extensive history of baseball, but in recent times, not many compared to the intense ebb and flow of Josh Johnson's career. That'll do it for his story, and that'll do it for this video. If you guys enjoyed it, consider leaving a like on the video and subscribing to the Jolly Off channel. I'd really appreciate it. That'll do it for me, and I'll see you guys next time.